Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Pat Monaghan. I'm the Society's President, and I have the pleasure of chairing tonight's meeting. Uh, before I start to do that, I'd just like to remind you, if you haven't been here before, uh, should the fire alarm go off, it will be a real fire, probably, <laughs> and you exit either from the back or the side doors. Uh, could I also ask, ask you please to turn your telephones to silent or off so that we, we don't hear your calls coming through. So this evening's speaker is David Edgar. Uh, and David is one of the UK's most prolific playwrights. Uh, he's written and published over 60 plays, uh, which have been form, performed nationally and internationally. And he's had a long-term association with the Royal Shakespeare Company. In fact, he gave them one of their all-time hits, was, was an adaptation of Nicholas Nickleby, which I think, if I'm right, lasted eight and a half hours. <laughs> But, but that's not what he's got for us tonight. Uh, and, and more recently, he also did an adaptation for the Royal Shakespeare Company of A Christmas Carol. Uh, David has been writing plays since he was a very small child and uh, had aspirations to be an actor, but uh, playwriting is what he mainly does. And he's a firm believer in the power of drama to get messages across, whether that be a message that's political or a, me a message about injustice or whatever. So most of his plays have either a social or a political message in them. So he's covered topics like uh, the uh, rise of the National Front, uh, again, something which we could do with another play on that. Uh, what are the social consequences of the minor strike? Um, the disintegration of Eastern Europe. That's just a flavor of the kinds of things that he has covered. And he courageously, just uh, fairly recently, in fact, it was also part of the uh, Edinburgh Fringe in, I think, 2019, he very bravely uh, had a one-man play which he performed and wrote. And in that play, he was confronted by his young radical self, calling him to account for what he had or hadn't done. And the picture up there uh, is of him acting that play and being quizzed about what happened to the Sergeant Pepper generation by his young self, and why did you give us Brexit, and so on. Um, I said that David is, he believes in the political messages or the social messages that drama can give us, and, and it's very prescient that we should have him here to talk about that this evening, given that we've all just been experiencing one of the major effects of that kind, the ITV drama, Mr. Bates versus the post office, and, and what an overturn that has made to the message that we got. So I'll hand you over now to David. Uh, first question, lovely, beautiful building. Can you hear me at the back of it? Great. Um, and second of all, to, to, to thank Pat for inviting me to speak to the Society. Uh, I'm privileged to be part of a series which includes uh, many lectures on science, as well as talks on bioethics, climate change, and indeed a complete history of capitalism uh, by lecturers much more distinguished and erudite than I. Uh, thanks also to George Rawlinson for patience, persistence, and hassle-free arrangements. I must also thank your member, Richard Lutz, uh, who recommended me 
Uh, I didn't know until last week that my and my wife, Steph's, visit to Glasgow would coincide with Richard and Jane's 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, when we get to the glass raising bit of the evening, I shall certainly be raising at least one to them. Uh, when I was three and three quarters, uh, my parents first took me to the theatre. The play was Beauty and the Beast by Nicholas Stuart Gray, and at the first entrance of the masked and fearsome creature, I screamed the place down. Eventually, my behaviour became so disruptive that I had to be removed from the auditorium, and as conveniently my aunt was the administrator of the theatre, I was able to be escorted backstage to meet the now maskless beast in his dressing room, to shake his hand, to watch him put his mask back on again, to shake his hand a second time, and to be taken back into the auditorium. Thus reassured, as you can imagine, on his next entrance, I screamed the play star. I've had good experience of the theatre since, but none quite like that. A year later, I went to the same playhouse, the Birmingham Repertory Theatre, to see the same authors, The Tinderbox, a play full of sinister witches and huge dogs. Uh, but, I, but, but this time, I was wise. I'd realised that it was illusion, and I'd realised also there was nothing in the world I wanted to do more than help make such illusions. From the day the magic died, or more accurately, the day I realised that's what it was, I wanted to be up there with the magicians. Uh, between uh, the ages of 13 and 19, however, as Pat mentioned, I found my ambitions somewhat narrowed. Following a disastrous performance as Miss Prism in The Importance of Being Earnest at my all-boys school, personally, I blame the shoes. My mother concluded, well, it's not going to be acting, is it, dear? In subsequent years, I realised or was informed it was unlikely to be designing, directing, nor stage management either. I came to writing plays by process of elimination. And when I left university, even more when I left a short career in journalism three years later, I knew I wanted to be a playwright of a particular kind. I wanted to be part of a new wave of political playwriting which had dominated British theatre since the premiere of John Osborne's groundbreaking attack on the smugness and atrophy of post-war Britain in his play, Look Back in Anger, premiered at the Royal Court Theatre in May 1956. I want to talk about what that was and in my view remains a good decision. Why, despite many and growing challenges, of which more later, those who say that new theatre writing is in decline are wrong. Why, over the last 60 years, the great questions of British society have been more consistently, rigorously, and durably confronted in new plays than anywhere else. Of course, there have been peaks and troughs, periods in which film or television drama or the novel appeared to speak more prominently for the times. Many of the plays which have had political impact have done so partly because they've been broadcast on television. And there is, as I shall argue later, a profound irony that as that more and more drama departments and universities have offered courses in playwriting, the people who run and teach in those departments appeared increasingly persuaded that playwriting is dead and that the future lies in forms of playmaking which don't involve writers at all. But for all this, I still believe that since the premiere of Look Back in Anger, in wave upon wave, new theatre writing in Britain has been a huge success story, proving in Balzac's ringing phrase, the most effective secretary of the times. So from 1956 to the mid sixties, the first generation of Royal Court dramatists, John Osborne himself, Arnold Wesker, the early plays of Edward Bond, defined both a new kind of play, the kitchen sink drama, and a new kind of writer, the angry young man. In the 1970s, the radical generation which had come to adulthood in the late 60s 
charted the disillusionment and even collapse of post-war British society. In the 1980s, another generation challenged the place of women in society, history, and the family. Well, in the 90s, the upsurge of so-called in-your-face theatre gave voice to a generation which had grown up during the Thatcher years in plays which swept the continent. And we haven't even gotten into the 21st century. The main reason for this success is that these generations of writers found ways of addressing the great changes that occur had occurred in British post-war society in a way that spoke to the people that brought them about. But there were also some key institutional factors without which these waves of new playwriting would not have crashed so effectively to shore. First of all, British theatre was able to expand massively in the 60s and 70s, enabled by the abolition of stage censorship in the UK. Censorship had been instituted in the early 18th century to stop the political satires of Henry Fielding, and in the 1960s still prevented British playwrights from showing two men in bed together, mentioning venereal disease, criticizing the royal family, insulting friendly foreign powers, or representing God. The government's powers over theater were abolished in August 1968, enabling work of an overt sexual and political character, but also work that was topical or indeed improvised. Secondly, and partly as a result, there was a huge expansion of state subsidy to small-scale theatre in the late 60s, which enabled an explosion of alternative theatre spaces, often in non-buildings, in clubs and pubs and basements and attics, several performing at lunchtime and late night, variously dubbed the underground, the alternative and the fringe. I should add here that the fringe, the one in, in, in Edinburgh, had and still has an incalculable effect on alternative and indeed mainstream theatre. The Travis, founded in, Ed in Edinburgh in 1962 by American producer Jim Haynes, six years before he launched the London Arts Lab, was and remains at the core of new writing in Scotland. But we should also remember the Tron and Tramway in Glasgow. I have particular cause to remember the Pool Theatre uh, in Edinburgh Newtown which pioneered the production of non-festival plays at lunchtime, including two of mine. The lunchtime tradition has been preserved and expanded through the 20-year run of David McLennan's programme at Oran Moor, at which I enjoyed a pie, a pint and a play this very lunchtime. These new spaces allowed huge amounts of new work to be performed. It was rumoured that in the early 70s it was possible to write a two to three handed play lasting under an hour so terrible that no one would put it on, but it was pretty hard and I never managed it. But in addition to providing an outlet for writers, the Fringe also provided a new training ground for actors who insisted that when they moved on to work at the great inst theatrical institutional theatres, the collaborative processes they had learnt on the Fringe be applied in the rehearsal rooms of the conventional theatre. Third, new writing had been supported by artistic directors who could perfectly well have decided, as many of their continental equivalents did, to concentrate on the flashier business of directing the classics. While at the same time, young theatre writers sought to overcome their traditional isolation by developing all kinds of collective methods and institutions. A new theatre writers union negotiated contracts for writers and pressurized the Arts Council and other funding bodies to encourage theatres not just to do the existing canon, the Greeks, Shakespeare, Sheridan, Wilde, Barry, Shaw and Coward, but to increase the number of new plays. Living playwrights are always in competition with the dead. Playwrights being, after all, the only theatre professionals who can do their job perfectly adequately from six feet underground. These institutional developments were a necessary but not sufficient condition for the flowering of new writing, which began in the late 50s. New theatre writing has had a subject which has spoken to audiences who couldn't find discussions of those matters anywhere else. 
or rather it had subjects. As is the way with ger generational change, each new wave sought to both to renew and to overthrow what had gone before. So from 1956 to the mid sixties, the first generation of royal court dramatists confronted the cultural consequences of post-war working class empowerment, sometimes with enthusiasm, sometimes with alarm. The angry young man of the kitchen sink drama, the socially uprooted existential precarious child of the 1944 Education Act was appalled by Suez, but equally paralyzed by Hungary. My generation, the one that followed, was enabled by the abolition of censorship and the expansion of alternative theater to take a much more radical view of the theater experience. Indeed, its defining characteristics was that it sought a new audience outside theater buildings, often in collaboration with an alternative, non-literary avant-garde theater form, then called performance art, in collective advocacy and celebration of the revolutionary spirit of the age. That spirit was brought home to me most vividly by a particular event. I lived in the late 60s and early 70s in Bradford, which for reasons best known to itself, had won the North of England franchise of the late 60s hippie counterculture, and which played host to a veritable garden of exotic theatrical blooms during the two immensely successful uh, uh, Bradford festivals of 1970 and 1971. So successful were they, by the by, with so many people having such an obviously wonderful time that the city authorities refused to finance a third festival on the grounds that giving so many people so much unambiguous pleasure was clearly a gross abuse of public funds. Here you would find performance artists careering around the city on pink bicycles ridden in red army, a red arrow formation. There, my friend Howard Brenton's play about the Scot of the Antarctic was being performed in the city's ice rink, with myself playing the small but nonetheless significant role of the Almighty. While somewhere else, portable theatre were presenting an early David Hare or Snoo Wilson play, as like as not, involving loud bangs and dead dogs, the welfare state performance troupe was enacting a pagan child ceremony in the city's wool exchange with fire eaters and, for some reason, real goats. And Albert Hunt's art college group was staging a full-scale mock-up of an American presidential election with live elephant in the streets of the city. And somewhere else again in clubs and pubs, agitprop groups with names like Red Ladder and The General Will were relating contemporary labor history and joining in their own way, the general and universal call for the overthrow of all fixed things. I emphasize what these theater makers have in common because for reasons I'll come back to, the alternative theater movement they launched has either been hidden from history or misrepresented. A latterly imposed binary division between text-based and devised theatre work has led some theatre chroniclers to define the alternative theatre as essentially about collaborative playmaking methods to which writers and writing were opposed. Of course, there were devising companies, particularly in the performance art sectors, though some worked with writers. I spent a delightful summer making a show about bicyclists with the Halifax-based performance troupe, the John Bull Puncture Repair Kit. But most of the major companies did things called plays by people called playwrights. People who wrote for such companies included John Arden, Edward Bond, Carol Churchill, Howard Brenton, and Pam Jems. While playwrights who founded such companies included David Hare, Portable Theatre, Noel Gregg, Gay Sweatshop, Sue Todd, the feminist company, Monstrous Regiment, and John McGrath, 784 Scotland. 784's title referred to the statistic that 7% of the population owned 84% of the wealth, a statistic that appears totally egalitarian today. There was a doubtless apocryphal story that a petrol pump attendant, seeing the statistic on the side of the company's van, had asked what it meant and when he was told, responded, well, there's no need to brag about it. McGrath wrote and directed what was probably the most successful play to be produced by the alternative 
theatre movement of the 70s. His play about the Highland clearances and their aftermath, the Cheviot, the Stag and the Black Black Oil, an agitprop show in Cayley format, which toured Highland's venues, clearly transformed the audiences which saw it, as it did a much wider audience on television. John remained involved in popular non-theatre-based socialist drama for the rest of his life. However, some of us who started out in the alternative theatre decided to try and break into mainstream theatre, particularly the great institutional theatres of England, the Royal Court, the Royal Shakespeare Company and the National Theatre. Plays like David Hare's Plenty at the National, uh, about the diplomatic service, Howard Brenton's The Churchill Play at Nottingham Playhouse, and My Destiny at the RSC shared a number of characteristics, of which the most important were a hostility to domestic and family settings, a determination to write plays set in present-day England, and a shared model of what had made that England what it was. In essence, our plays pursued elements of a single grand narrative, which went roughly like this. Britain had been on the right side in the war against Hitler, but had squandered its moral capital afterwards. There'd been a chance after the war to create a genuine egalitarian, emancipatory socialism, but it was implemented too half-heartedly by the 1945 to 51 Labour government and the opportunity had been lost. The country had then held a kind of party in the 50s and 60s, squandering its post-imperial riches, and in the 70s had gone into freefall political, economic, social and moral decline, at the end of which it was assumed final collapse would occur and true socialism would emerge phoenix-like from the ashes. And of course, something new did emerge at the end of the 70s, but it sure as hell wasn't true socialism. Uh, but the resurgent conservatism of Margaret Thatcher. More profound than our embarrassment, however, was a sense that had been growing through the latter 70s, that the emergent social issues were not to be constrained within the iron certainties of class politics, but were, were to be found within the, much, within the crevices of the much more fragile, porous, and in many ways intriguing geology of difference. Suddenly in the 80s, it ceased to be compulsory for committed playwrights to be called Howard, David or John. In 1979, there were two currently writing nationally known women writers in Britain, Pam Jones and Carol Churchill. A decade later, there were through two to three dozen. Between 1956 and 1980, 8% of the plays presented at the Royal Court in London were by women, in the 1980s, it was 38%, albeit 38% of less. Many of those writers came from the regions and nations of the United Kingdom, which themselves saw significant entries to the ranks of major playwrights. The Northwest had its Claire Luckham and Charlotte, Charlotte Keatley, as well as Willie Russell and Alan Bleasdale. Important emergent Irish writers included Anne Devlin and Christina Reid, as well as Billy Roach and Frank McGuinness. The striking renaissance of Scottish playwriting in the late 70s and 80s included Chris Hannan, Tom McGrath and John Byrne, but also Liz Lockhead and Sharman MacDonald, to be joined later by Marcella Everisti, Anne Downey and Rona Munro. Lockheed's uh, remarkable 1987 play, Mary, Queen of Scots, Got Her Head Chopped Off, was one of a number of plays by Scottish women playwrights to revisit history from a feminist perspective anticipating Rona Munro's 2016 trilogy of plays about three of the early Jameses to rule Scotland in the 15th century. Of course, something else was going on in the 80s, also involving women moving into hitherto male roles. What happened with Mrs Thatcher's election in 1979 in the arts as everywhere else was a power shift from the producer to the consumer. Mrs. Thatcher's great political insight was that she could use the marketplace to achieve essentially political objectives. In culture, as much as in industrial relations, she sought to demand the left by letting the market rip. So, like passengers, patients, and parents, playgoers became customers, who, as we know, are always right. The first effect of this on culture was on the high avant-garde. People were no longer prepared to accept 
that if they didn't understand something, it was their fault. Then, dominated by market demand of what, of what the audience liked last time, theatre repertoires became increasingly homogenous. In 1988, if you went to the theatre in Britain and didn't see the seagull or gaslight, they gave you a small cash prize. This had, of course, a damaging effect on the production of new plays. From 1970 to 1985, new work formed roughly 12% of the repertoire of the main houses uh, of the national, regional, and London repertory theatres. From 1985 to 1990, it dropped to 7%. And this was justified by growing belief that new work had run out of steam. It became fashionable for young directors to announce they couldn't possibly be bothered with the triviality of the contemporary, and they certainly couldn't possibly cope with the trauma of having a living writer in the rehearsal room. By the end of the 80s then, it seemed to many that new writing was on the way. Of course, this was all wrong. The explosion of new writing in the mid 90s, known as in your face theater, had a transformative effect on the British theater scene. The work of the English Mark Ravenhill and Sarah Kane and the Scots Anthony Nielsen and Gregory Burke among others, was characterized by being about young people, having a cool and sheeny style, and containing explicit sex, drug use, and violence. It spread rapidly across Europe. Like any regular theater traveler, I now know the words for shopping, fucking, blasted, and psychosis in all of the languages of the expanded EU. Once again, British new writing was in the forefront of a whole new wave. And what of this century? Well, it began with a dip. But it's clear that almost immediately, theatre gained a new subject, the war on terror, and a new form in which to debate it, fact-based or verb verbatim drama. From the dramatisation of important trials and tribunals at the Tricycle Theatre in North London, to interview-based plays about subjects ranging from the Middle East conflict and railway privatization to the financial crisis in Guantanamo Bay, this was happening in a decade in which new plays suddenly broke through the 20% barrier and increased to over 40% of the theater repertoire. It was a huge success story for playwrights, but also for directors, theater companies, and an arts council England, which had encouraged theaters to produce new plays for so many years. How weird then, that in this same period, the first decade of this century, the Arts Council decided that text-based drama as a whole was on the way out and that the future lay somewhere else entirely. In May 2001, Arts Council England published an unusually authoritative report by a consultancy into the roles and functions of English regional producing theatres. For Peter Boyd and Associates, English theatre was stuck in the past, dangerously wedded to a post-war age and a classical theatrical canon which the public no longer knew. He concluded that text-based drama is in relative decline. As I've said, traditionally, the big distinction in theatre repertoire had been between plays by dead people and new work. Now a new fault line in theatre repertoire had been drawn between an allegedly dusty, out-of-date, text-based drama that's everything from the Persians to Fleabag, from the back eye to Blasted, and on the other hand, a vibrant, popular, and up-to-the-minute theatre based on devised scripts, innovative site-specific productions, and physically-based performance techniques. As a result of this report, the English Arts Council dropped new writing from its production priorities in favor of giving particular emphasis to experimental practices, circus and street arts. After all, why would you want to give emphasis to a theater form that had clearly had its day? Except, as I've said, that it wasn't. This development was happening in a decade during which, sure, there was a small increase in performance work, much of it innovative and brilliant, by the kind of companies I'd worked alongside in the Bradford festivals. But the big story was new plays. Why was this missed? 
One answer is that there was and still is, though to a lesser extent, a prevailing culture in drama, theatre studies and increasingly performance studies departments in universities, which was profoundly hostile to the authored play, which has fashioned an armory of anti-textual theory for the performers, producers, critics and funders who studied there. The root of this long-term development was the proper ambition of drama departments, which were founded in the 60s and 70s, to distinguish themselves from English departments by paying attention to drama in performance rather than plays on the page. This shift clearly drew on contemporary literary theory and obviously had its effect on how playwriting was discussed. In what was probably the first book to apply such theory to plays, Adrian Page's 1992, The Death of the Playwright, question mark. Uh, this book challenged the moribund concept of a single meaning authorised by the playwright. However, Page's project was clearly not to eliminate the playwright, but to widen the notion of stage authorship. After all, there was that question mark. What's happened since 1992 is something different not so much a buttressing of the study of the texts we have inherited with study of how they were performed, but a downgrading and even exclusion of those texts from consideration, not so much the author's dethronement as his or her expulsion. No wonder that playwrights often felt as welcome in contemporary theatre studies departments as toddlers at the court of King Herod. The range of study had not been expanded but contracted, a necessary corrective had become a prevailing orthodoxy. It's hard to find a single study which expresses this orthodoxy, but although, like the Higgs boson, invisible, the anti-textual presumption organises thought across a wide, a wide spectrum. American critics talk about the coercive system of Aristotelian poetics and directors of the imperialism of the fascist text. One anti-text critic describes individually written plays as commodity theater, another as factory processed, capitalist and conquering. Uh, I believe uh, neither of which terms intended to be compliments. A third claimed that British theater culture is an inherently snobbish, xenophobic, conservative and reaction, because it is con con consistently literary. While Eric Earn, head of playwriting at Brown University in Rhode Island, believes that linear dramaturgy is the implementation of a genocidal authority on the grounds that stories end. So there we have it. The playwrights work as imperialist, fascist, coercive, xenophobic, capitalistic and genocidal thereby a proper questioning of the idea that there's only one way to make plays had mutated into the idea that the individual playwright cannot, by his or her very nature, initiate work which addresses the contemporary world. So the truth that there's more than one way to produce theatre texts becomes devising is better than individual writing becomes the individual writer cannot treat of the contemporary world becomes playwrights are the enemy. The logophobic turn in the academy obscured an unprecedented change in real world British theatre repertoire. In 2013 and 2014, the British Theatre Consortium analysed box office data from all the building based and some of the larger touring companies, the biggest exploration of repertoire data in history. These reports found that over 50% of productions, performances, attendances, and box office earnings were now of new writing, original plays, adaptations, and translations, which had overtaken revivals in all categories for the first time since records began. Something had also happened harder to quantify, but clearly visible to the naked eye. The first two decades of the 21st century, and God knows the third decade so far, saw a series of previously unthinkable political upheavals. From 9-11 via the 2008 crash in the Arab Spring to Brexit and Trump, 
and the first major war on European so so soil since 1945. Movements that emerged in the last two thirds of the 20th century, feminism and anti-racism, were given renewed energy and urgency by the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements. Not surprisingly, most playwrights work addressed those themes. Much of this work was and is by young writers, often Asian or Afro-Caribbean. The plays of the noughts and the tens range in setting from Kabul to California and from Brussels to Basra and delved into history. Their subjects from the NHS, education and personal debt via celebrity culture, climate change and the army to immigration, Islam and the legacy of colonialism and slavery. The play generally accepted as the best English play of this century, Jez Butterworth's Jerusalem, is about national identity. Probably the best Scottish play is an interview-based play about militarism, masculinity, and again, national identity, Gregory Burke's Black Watch. Up until lockdown, at least, most plays on British stages uh, in the tens were both new and political. The battle against the theatre of revivals and for a theatre of public and for a theatre of public life had been won. And something else had happened. Other waves of, uh, waves of political theatre in the mainstream had impacted content and the culture of the rehearsal room, but had had little effect on the way plays were cast, teamed, designed, and produced. For the first time now the politics of diversity, inclusion, and sustainability are being embedded within theatre processes, changing who is cast and employed, how they are treated in rehearsals, the physical materials used in production, and how they are powered and lit. It's possible that theatre could return to the drawing rooms and country houses of the early 1950s, but its very structures would need to be unpicked. And what about impact? We've just seen probably the most directly influential piece of drama ever made, Gwyneth Hughes's Mr. Bates and the Post Office, about a scandal that had already been well publicized in radio and television documentaries, but only caught the public eye and crucially imagination when it was dramatized. This fact-based documentary drama followed Jimmy McGovern's Hillsborough and Rob Rich's Who Bombed Birmingham, which again, following documentary exposés, played a key role in freeing the Birmingham Six. Fictional television dramas which stirred the conscience of the nation include Alan Bleasdale's, Bleasdale's Boys from the Black Stuff about unemployment in the 1980s and Jeremy Sanford's Kathy Come Home about homelessness in the 1960s. Our view of the First World War in particular was formed by works of art, from the Georgian poets to Blackadder Goes Forth. But it was also formed, crucially, by R.C. Sheriff's interwar stage play, Journey's End, and perhaps most profoundly of all, Joan Littlewood's 1963 musical, Oh, What a Lovely War, on stage and on film. As, in the same way, Walter Greenwood's Love on the Dole which toured the country in two separate companies in the 1930s, was a smash hit in the West End and was seen by three million people, including the King, and did for the 1930s what Boys from the Black Stuff was to do for the 1980s. Fact-based post-war theatre plays, which had significant public impact, tended to be those that were broadcast on television, including Cheviot, uh, but also the Richard Norton Taylor's The Colour of Justice, an edited version of the inquiry into the death of Stephen Lawrence. Norton Taylor also edited sections of the Grenfell Inquiry, uh, while Gillian Slovo uh, wrote an interview base play about the disaster for the National Theatre, as well as a play about the 2011 London riots, alongside Alecky Blythe's piece on the same subject. My play about the National Front in the 1970s, Destiny helped to spread the idea that the National Front was indeed a Nazi front, by no means conventional wisdom, in the late 1970s. And in 2009, two plays, uh, one of them a strict interview-based verbatim play, 
reactivated a campaign to reopen the scandal of four young army recruits who died in separate suspicious circumstances at one army barracks in Surrey. Theatre was a key site for debates within the emerging women and gay movements of the 1970s and 80s. Later plays about AIDS, including uh, the American Tony Kushner's Angels in America, having a particular impact. Kwame Kwe Amar's trilogy of plays about black British institutions, a restaurant, a bookshop and a think tank, was one of a number of dramas which communicated the black British experience to stage audiences decades before Steve McQueen's small acts hit the television screens. Plays defining the post-war zeitgeist range from Sheila Delaney's A Taste of Honey, Val, Car Val Carol Churchill's Top Girls and Serious Money, to Jasmine Lee Jones's Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner and Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Fleabag. So by the mid-2010s, theatre was dominated by new political plays, a situation which some of us had fought all our lives for. It was, however, confronting problems which are now seen as existential. Initially masked by innovative initiatives like the live streaming of plays to cinemas, the cuts uh, which began to be implemented by the coalition government in 2010 bit ever deeper as the decade proceeded, particularly into regional theatres, much more reliant uh, than London on funding from local government, which bore the brunt of the government's devolve the axe policy of austerity defunding. Incidentally, today, my home city of Birmingham has announced cutting virtually all of its arts funding. Existing difficulties were exacerbated by lockdown, the longest closure of British theatres since the 17th century Commonwealth, from which box office attendances, particularly outside London, have not yet recovered. The shutdown created a large backlog of plays which had been scheduled but not performed, and the reopening a greater suspicion of risk. Literary departments, an essential component of the growth in new writing, had already been cut back and were cut back further, leading to a culture of commissioning writers and then ghosting them, leading to a wholesale evacuation of successful young writers to television. The succession writer's room was particularly well populated by British playwrights in exile. A number, another contributor to that was the syndrome of the so-called Primark playwright, presented once by a theatre and then abandoned. To compensate for debts incurred during lockdown, the rising cost of living and a mounting number of stars imported from film and television, West End theatre prices are inflating insanely and theatre is relying on, an oft, on often musical adaptations of movies and television series. From Brokeback Mountain, Mrs. Doubtfire and Bonnie and Clyde to Only Fools and Horses and Spitting Image with The Devil Wears Prada and Faulty Towers waiting in the wings. That Scotland is facing as many challenges as England and Wales, whose national theatre is threatened with extinction, was shown clearly in Disappearing Act, a 2023 report funded by Creative Scotland and commissioned by the six major producing theatres, including the Traverse, the Lyceum, Pitlochry, and the Citizens and Tron here in Glasgow. These theatres also face standstill government funding and huge increases in costs, alongside audiences slow to return after COVID to an industry in which only 15% of theatre seen in Scotland was made here. The report concludes that there is a very realistic prospect of significant venue closures, if not an end to a credible producing theatre sector in Scotland overall. And a fortnight ago, London's Royal Court Theatre, the leading new writing theatre in Britain and arguably the world, announced the closure of its outreach, international and literary departments in an attempt to combat a financial crisis that has been brewing for years. The light at the end of this tunnel seems increasingly distant, and it's hard to end on an optimistic note. But the huge changes that happened in the decades before lockdown were almost all in the right direction and could be again. 
however threatened by bad theatre practice and the lure of television, I see a new generation of writers joining the angry young men of the 50s, the post-68 revolutionaries of the 70s, the women playwrights of the 80s, the interface brat pack of the 90s, and the fact-based dramatists of the noughts, finding new audiences and addressing issues that are immediate and important to them, and which are best confronted, confronted in the shared space of dramatic fiction. 20 years ago, the National Theatre presented Heath Bliss Dewhurst's blistering adaptation of Mikhail Bulgakov's satirical novel, Black Snow, which contains a scene in which a young Russian playwright visits the great director Stanislavski to discuss his script. The elderly maestro is joined by his even more elderly aunt, who proceeds to inquire as to the purpose of the meeting. Leonta Sagavich has bought me a play, the director announces. Whose play? inquires the aunt. Leonti Sagavich has written the play himself, says the director. But why? demands the aunt. Aren't there enough plays already? There are so many good plays in the world, it would take 20 years to act them all. Why put yourself to all the trouble of writing a new one? Ah, explains the director. But Leonti Sagavich has written a modern play. To which his aunt responds, but we have nothing against the government. British playwrights have been characterised above all by their political, cultural, religious and ethnic diversity. But all of them have in common that when they wrote them, their plays were new, modern and had something against the government. Long may it so remain. Hi, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, with the explosion of um, streaming services and long arc stories that over maybe six to 10 hours, um, do you foresee current playlights um, moving backwards and forwards between stage and expanded television, if you like? Or do you feel that they will remain playwrights and or screenwriters? It's a very good question. Uh, the, the good news is that, unlike in America, the British television industry and the British theatre industry are concentrated pretty much in the same place, um, a small island, not exclusively London, um, uh, whereas in, 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 in America they're obviously 3,000 miles apart. Um, as I said, a lot of the problems that theatre faces, including some self-made ones, uh, have led to um, a, a fairly wholesale uh, uh, exile towards uh, towards television by by those playwrights who've been sought out by television, which is increasingly happening. Uh, I think any of us have been, all of us have been aware that television drama has expanded its range of subject matter. Uh, moved away from just being dramas about the world as seen from uh, a doctor's surgery, a police station, or the 19th century, uh, to being pretty much about anything you like. The remarkable uh, uh, success, uh, first of all, of, 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 uh, of, of streaming services in, in America and, and then expanding into Netflix, uh, Disney et al., um, has created a a, um, a forum, uh, a site for drama, uh, which is ex very exciting for playwrights. Um, historically, the deal was um, that you, uh, you you were you were paid much less in the theatre, uh, but it was more likely you'd get your work on, and you were treated nicely. Um, that now has has is generally held to be no longer the case. 
um, you're much more likely to get your call returned uh, from Netflix than you are from, I won't name any particular theatres, but there are a large number. Um, and, and, and so I think, I think that pressure is dangerous for theatre and uh, it's, it's very hard to argue uh, for a bright young uh, playwright who's worked on Succession or a whole number of other uh, uh, long form series to say, go back to the theatre um, and earn a great deal less money and, and, and find it harder to get in touch with the person employing you. Um, so I think it's something theatre needs to address. And, and I think it's a, it's a very real, real danger for, for the art form. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Can I ask about the challenges of writing about contemporary or very recent real life events? Is, does the playwright always have to worry about the libel lawyer um, hovering over them? And does that constrain what they can write about? Well, the, 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 there's a, a sort of saying that when you're writing about, I, I tend not to actually, but when you're writing plays which involve real people, um, the further you get away from um, being in danger of copyright infringement, the closer you get to dangers of libel, um, uh, you know, the, the more, the more you're, you're inventing. I mean, there haven't been very substantial cases um, of, of, of stage plays of which there have been a lot uh, based on, on, on real people um, protesting. I'm about to do a play uh, about uh, some, some actually uh, no longer with us people, uh, but um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware of a kind of, of a responsibility that writing fiction uh, doesn't entirely in, in, entirely have. Um, I think tele. I mean, it's interesting with with Mr. Bates how um, how drama in inevitably creates um, heroes and villains. In that particular case, I think it's pretty hard to argue that the villains were over villainized uh, in, 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 the, in the case of the post office. But there have been, I mean, there's been a, 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 the recent film about the exhumation of Richard III. I think some of the, uh, the academics who were involved with that felt that the film story of that was, 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 was unfair to, uh, to, 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 to a number of people who were involved beyond uh, the, the the passionate amateurs who 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 pursued who pursued the uh, who pursued the discovery that it was in fact Richard the Third and and his re, 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 reburial. So I, I think that you know there are dangers in which which um, I think responsible playwrights have to pay attention to in 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 uh, in writing about in writing about real people. Uh, can you? Uh, tell us who you think contemporary writers and theatres are carrying the torch forward? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I, I do think, I mean, you know, the most remarkable thing over the last 10 years, I think, has been the, the expansion of um, plays by young women, and as I said, often... Uh, Afro-Caribbean or, or, or Asian, and, and, I, and I think that is uh, that's the most dramatic change, and and I can't see that changing, and I, you know I don't think anybody would 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 want it to. Um, in terms of uh, emerging, pe I mean I I don't think there's a playwright, possibly um, possibly the author of of, of Seven Methods of Killing, um, uh, uh, Kylie. Uh, Jenna, thank you very much. Uh, 76th birthday on Monday. This, this will start happening to you. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think she's a major emergent talent. Uh, I, I, I think, obviously, um, Fleabag is the emergence of a major talent. Uh, and, uh, you know, we will, we, obviously, you look back 10 years on and, and are sometimes surprised by who is... Who has kept up a career um, uh, and, uh, and who hasn't? Uh, but I think the one of the things which I sort of hinted at in the talk, but I didn't talk about very extensively, is is my very firm belief, um, which is not, I think, entirely due to my own personal age, but is that one of the responsibilities of um, subsidy is to give people whole careers whole life careers, if, if they want it. 
uh, and classically in America, uh, playwrights you know operate on the firework principle of of, of blazing uh, brightly in the sky and then falling to earth. Uh, and and the latter work of of Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams. Uh, got actually a better outing in in other countries than America than it did on their own uh, home soil. So I d I do think it's important that theatre doesn't con concentrate exclusively on the emerging, and it's a little bit of a feeling that that's what's happened over over recent years, partly because of the effort to make theatre uh, uh, more diverse. Uh, but who of those playwrights um, will 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 have sustained careers? Uh, who knows? Uh, but but I see no reason why they shouldn't. To get back to uh, the Mr. Bates uh, play, do you find it phenomenal that it takes a TV show to really force the government to attack the whole scandal of these post office post office mistresses being screwed by the post office, as opposed to the parliamentary debate and the media that attention. It takes a TV show, a fictional, a fictional, almost a fictionalized TV show with a famous actor, Toby Young, to be in it. Are you appalled by this, or do you think it's a natural progression? Um, well, I think it's, it's it, to this one, to this, in this case, I think it's phenomenal. Um, on, on the night of the last episode, ITV broadcast um, a documentary, um, uh, which was interesting, but, you know, always interesting to see what the real people looked like and how well it had been cast and all that. Um, and it was a fairly, it, the documentary I felt was the footnotes, you know, was the kind of factual footnotes, the drama. And I thought it was, if I'm honest, I thought it was a little bit pedestrian, but very helpful. Two days, two days later, a panorama was broadcast, which was really, I think, a phenomenal piece of reporting. And it was the one that, you know, discovered that the post office had, had had not decided not to give compensation to people because if they gave compensation to one person, the whole can of worms would would would, would open up. Uh, and I thought, my God, how how did Panorama get this? You know, they must have a spy in ITV and knew that they, and, and, and prepared. It, it was two years before. It was a repeat of a documentary from two years before. So I think the, the fact that. Uh, the conscience of the nation was was only stirred by a drama um, is is a fascinating question uh, and and I think is a tribute to 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 my medium um, I mean I think it's a, it's a, it's a tribute to drama uh, but it can present um, uh, it can you know it, it, it can get under the skin of an audience in the in 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 the way that 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 series did, and I'd I'd give a slightly roundabout example of that. Uh, David Hare wrote a um, a, a drama documentary which I referred to in passing about a uh, stage one about the privatization of the railways, and the the people he interviewed and quoted uh, were described as you know the head of a railway company the 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 leader of a railway union. I mean, they, they weren't identified, uh, but the, there had been a particular rail crunch, and um, the head of uh, a, a railway company was quoted as saying, my first thought was, thank God it's not us. And he protested very strongly to that being in the play because he felt it, 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 it showed him as being heartless about the victim. Uh, and you could imagine on the front page of a tabloid, you know, thank God it wasn't us, says rail boss, you know, would would be would, would be something that would 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 redound very badly on him. On the stage, it was really human. You know, which one of us in this room could actually say that for the first nano, I mean, for a nanosecond later, yes, how terrible the victims, but just for you know, terrible rail crash which company, not us, thank God. I think that that would be the human reaction. And presented on the stage, you're sympathetic. And I, I think it's the role of empathy. I, I, I think you put yourself into the shoes of the people who are wa you're watching. And actually, it, it's, it's, I think, a, an index of the power of dramatization, uh, a, a particularly dramatic index uh, that Mr. Bates had to wait for so long. Uh, to um, to hit hit the front pages. 
you've talked about real real life events such as the post office, and then there are historical plays. Are there any particular challenges about adapting books as plays? Or is that out with your experience? Yes. Um, I mean, I'm generally a bit worried about the amount of uh, theater, as I said, in terms of 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 stage versions, stage versions of films and television shows, about the amount of theater work that is, as it were, outsourced in terms of its source. Uh, the amount of, of of plays that are based on films or television series or books or whatever. Um, there was a actually rather good musical based on the Great British Bake Off uh, last year. Um, uh, uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, theatre has, this, for the last two and a half thousand years, uh, has obviously borrowed stories, but has, has very much made those stories, those stories its, 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 its own. Um, I mean, I, I've done a lot of adaptations and I've done two Dickens novels, uh, one of which um, uh, was, which had interestingly different problems. Uh, Nicholas Nickleby is is an, an early Dickens. He wrote it when he was twenty six, <laughs> and um, it's um, it's it, it it's a picaresque novel. The first half is better than the second half. Uh, there are quite a lot of plotting problems. Uh, you have to do quite a lot of carpentry uh, to make it work work for theatre, particularly if, as we wanted to do, we wanted to tell the whole of the story and not cut subplots, which is what you usually do when adapting Dickens, because there's so many. Um, Christmas Carol, on the other hand, is structured like a watch. The problem with Nicholas Nickleby is nobody knows very much about it. The problem with Christmas Carol is everybody knows everything about it. So you have to find a way of bringing the changes on a beautifully structured story, uh, which it would be very dangerous to fiddle with, uh, the actual plot. Um, that you have to find a way of ringing the changes which still delivers to an audience a thing called a Christmas carol, which if, as I was, uh, you're lucky enough to be performed in a large, you know, in a large theatre and you're the main Christmas show, uh, you, um, you know, you have a responsibility to deliver on, on, on that promise, uh, while also delivering on the promise that the, our, a company like the RSC uh, will have an intriguing and hopefully new take um and, and perhaps those to give examples from both of those uh with nicholas nickleby no, it wasn't my idea but the two directors trevor nunn and uh, john Kett, had the idea um because the, the problem with dickens is that his authorial voice is so important to the to the novels i mean only a couple, I think, of first person, but you feel the presence of Dickens very strongly. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to have, you know, a man with a beard standing at a lectern um, uh, uh, with a big book reading out the stage directions. So uh, what were effectively the stage directions. So we decided the whole, the whole very large company possessed the whole story. And whereas it were the collective narrator of the whole story, so that enabled us to use the narrative in a whole number of interesting and varied ways. Um, with Christmas Carol, I became fascinated by the fact that Dickens had originally intended uh, to write a pamphlet and issue it at Christmas, um, having read an extraordinary, I have to say, report on the condition of of the poor in 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 in, in, in employment in mines. Uh, and, and, and manufacturers in Britain, which is still reads as, a, as the most extraordinarily extraordinary condemnation of the conditions that people were working in uh, in, in in the eighteen thirties. And he he felt, I'm not going to write a novel. I'm going to write a I'm going to write a pamphlet, uh, and, and that will be my contribution to the Christmas season. And he was then persuaded uh, that it might be in his interests, um, actually, as well as everybody else's and, 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 and his cause, to write something uh, a little bit more, a little bit more immediately accessible to the populace. And he had this idea uh, six weeks before he delivered delivered the, the the text. I have to say to the printer, he had the idea um, uh, after having delivered a lecture at the Athenaeum in 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 in. Um, in Manchester, he, he walked through the streets of Manchester through the night uh, and worked it all out and wrote it very quickly. Uh, and that and that 
obviously had a much greater effect both then and later uh, on the conscience of the nation than um, uh, the, the, than any pamphlet would have done. So uh, what I did was I decided to put the thing within the frame of that decision by Dickens. So Dickens was a character and his friend and mentor uh, was, was another character and it started with an argument between them about what he should write for Christmas. Uh, and then you could, as it were, see him constructing the story uh, as a kind of puppet master through, uh, through the evening. Uh, and it allowed me also to draw attention to the social conditions against which Christmas Carol was protesting. So, in, you know, in both cases, we were doing obviously theatrical things uh, to what had started life out as a novel. Thank you very much for a very flowery and po poetic presentation of the theatre that I never ever saw in the last 50 years. However, you seem to indicate that alternative performance drama was a great theme. My question is, should or is alternative performance drama subsidised by either local or national government as it may not be commercially viable. Should we be subsidizing it? Um, well, we're not subsidizing it nearly as much as we did. And you could argue that um, that's been to the detriment, not only of the alternative theater, but also of the theater as a whole, because what happened in the seventies was a large, including me, a large number of people um, who had learned their craft in the alternative theater, uh, subsidized, yes, well paid now uh, went on into the mainstream and transformed it and transformed most aspects of, of the way theatre was made and I said at the end so I think it's really important uh, that what we're now seeing uh, you know is transformation of the way and I think perhaps the most obvious and dramatic example is, is not to do with casting though that's really important and and you know People you employ and everything, but 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 the whole notion that theatre should be sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainable, uh, in terms of how shows are lit and how shows are powered, uh, and whether or not you reuse materials or whether or not you know you 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 make new costumes for every production and make new sets for every production. But I think that's a you know a really important commitment by my industry uh, towards. Uh, towards actually putting its 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 practices where its where its mouth is in terms of uh, of the environment. With, so, so I think I think the subsidy of the of the alternative theatre is part and parcel of the debate about whether there should be subsidy uh, for theatre at all. And this debate has ranged back and forth. There are very good arguments that Melvin Gra Bragg presented recently, repeated recently in the House of Lords about the economic benefits to, to tourism, to, uh, I, th I think it was actually a study here in Glasgow that demonstrated uh, that every, every theatre job produces uh, two and a half further jobs uh, in, in the industries which, which surround theatre and, and, and rely on it in terms of, of restaurants and hotels and everything else. Um, and uh, th those arguments are good. There have also been uh, good arguments about uh, theatre as a, as a kind of social force, uh, the use of theatre and in, 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 in the arts in general in, 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 in health, uh, in the criminal justice system, uh, and, and perhaps slightly more ethereal arguments about, about the benefits to all of us um of 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 fiction and and drama uh, and the arts and the you know the truth is that nobody has found a way uh, of producing the kind of breadth um of of, of provision uh, that we now have uh, without it being subsidized um and in that you know it why subsidize libraries why subsidize parks why subsidize armies why subsidize roads uh, because the market can't actually provide them uh, in the quantities and the quality that is required. So if, if, if we generally feel that it's a good thing that these things are here and do the things they do, um, then public subsidy of some sort uh, is necessary uh, for those activities to continue. 
thanks very much for what I thought was an excellent talk, uh, full of life. Um, can I ask about the monsters? Um, about the monsters. All right. The, the monstrous people who are so powerful in the way we live now. And I'm, I've got three monsters. Uh, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, and Rupert Murdoch. Now, why aren't people writing dramas about them? And if you're going to mention Succession, which I think was a kind of portrayal about Murdoch, yeah. it, it's, I've never seen it. But from what I understand, it humanised him. It went on about his family and not about the horrific effect he's had on our society over decades. It's a good point about, I mean, and, and, and succession, I mean, if you can ever be persuaded to watch it, I say you have a treat in store. Uh, and it's, it's, its brilliance is that it's about a, a completely unattractive family full of ghastly people, um, which you follow with the kind of morbid fascination that you follow Richard III and Iago. I mean, that they, they are. They're, they're, there's, they're, there is a humanization. I take that point. Uh, there is in no sense a justification, and there is no sense a, uh, a an argue a, an argument that there is that there is virtue to be found. Um, uh, there is none. Um, uh, and I think one of the functions of drama is well, one of the function one of the things that drama has traditionally done, and I think done, done very well, is to explore evil. Um, and, you know, Richard III, Macbeth, Iago um, are, are, you know, among the great works uh, because they explore something. They explore, and I'm not suggesting that anyone in this room is in any sense a prototype Trump or Murdoch, um, but I think when we, when we watch those dramas, uh, we are aware uh, not that any of us uh, 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 are, are Iago or could become Iago, but that there's a little bit of Iago in all of us as, as the great uh, one of the, 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 the great writers about, about theatre, Eric Bentley, says. Um, we, we, we don't watch uh, King Lear uh, in fascination because any of us have flung our father out into the storm, but because all of us have, on one occasion or another, wanted to. <laughs> Uh, and I think, again, I think it goes it goes back to the unique uh, the unique power of of, of 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 drama to create empathy. On dramas about Trump, um, I, I, I've written a play called The New Real, which is uh, a, a play with fictional characters, uh, but is, is is an attempt to, it's an attempt to be an origin story of of, of the national populism which has spread. Uh, from from Warsaw via Wokington to Wisconsin, uh, with the ghastly effects that we know about, and which may lead to an even more ghastly outcome in 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 November, when just as the the play closes, um, uh, and 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 so and and um, there was a very good play about about uh, about Trump by Mike Bartlett uh, performed at the Old Vic. Uh, and I suspect, I suspect there will be there will be more. I think people are writing uh, more about uh, uh, directly about political events. Going back to an earlier question, there is there is a a, a problem about writing theatre um, about um, about political events, which which is the 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 the, the, the penalties of having to withdraw a stage show because Princess Diana has died, which happened um seem to be a bit greater than postponing a theater you know postponing a television um uh, a piece that might 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 reference it so, so the, the, the little bit of a problem of the danger of being overtaken by your own event but for me a much greater danger in the theater uh, are procedures which mean that it's takes longer and longer and longer to get a play on, so it's very difficult to write topically. And I much prefer people to write write topical drama, even if even with the danger of falling on your face, uh, than not writing topical drama at all. Could I just could I ask a question? Um, you talked about students. Um, I mean, one's heard of the mythical thing of media studies and whenever yeah, yeah. a politician wants to sort of lambast they pick it up but what i hadn't been aware of and and just pick up your point about drama schools and and the way that you think that 
the 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 way that uh, teaching or whatever is happening in drama schools is is sort of almost deconstructing things is there any way forward or any future in, in drama schools to try and get back to to something do you see any hope in in the future in that I must make a distinction between drama schools and drama departments in universities. I mean, drama schools refers to colleges which now give degrees and, and are very academically reputable, but essentially train, you know, a, a conservatoire. They, they train people in Russian. And, and because they are, are training people to go into the real world of the actual theatre, um, then, then th 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 they are less infected by, by certain academic uh, and scholastic fa fashions which i think i think are largely on the wane um i i bang on about it because um i want them those fashions to be on the wane and you've got to keep bashing at things to make sure they don't uh, rear their heads again uh, uh, every sort of 10 years or so the the arts council gets obsessed with 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 the idea that um with the idea that 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 the individually written play is dead, um, uh, or, or, or less morally reputable than other ways of making plays. Uh, but I, th I think partly if people are going to stand up and argue for the individually written play, because uh, certainly people are going to continue putting them on, uh, I, 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 I think the, 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 the very real insights and lessons that can be drawn from literary theory as applied to drama, and I, you know, I'm not a kind of um an academic luddite on this uh but that 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 the, the, they don't extend they don't get taken to the logical extreme uh, of of saying that the very act of playwriting is 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 um aesthetically and morally reprehensible uh, which some of those ideas uh, got got extremely close to or indeed went beyond i would like to ask you a question um, I wanted to ask you about censorship, uh, yeah. especially in the United Kingdom. Um, when did censorship come in? You told us when, when it went out. When it went out, but who brought it in? It was brought in by Robert Walpole uh, in, in, in um, I think, 1727 or, seven, um, or 1737. It's a wonderful counterfactual because um, Henry Fielding wrote these wonderfully scabrous um, satires of, 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 of our leaders, which would, would be regarded with, with great concern e e even now. And if, if, if Walpole hadn't, uh, and then, and then when, when Sunship was brought in, he couldn't do that anymore, so he wrote Tom Jones. So, so Wood, Wood and invented the British novel. Uh, obviously, other people were inventing the novel in other places, but there is a sort of wonderful counterfactual that it hadn't been for theatre censorship. Fielding would, would have remained a stage playwright, and the, British, the, the story of the British novel would have been very different. Okay. Uh, well, there's, there's one more there, I think. One more. Yes, yes. Just a quick question for somebody who said that from a very early age he was never going to be a, uh, an actor. What was it like to be on the fringe as a single, single uh, I man? I adored it. I adored every aspect of it. I loved having a dressing room. I loved going out afterwards and people, people knowing who I was and telling me, sometimes how wonderful I was. Uh, I, I enjoyed the tour. I loved digs. I just, I was just, I thought, why have I spent all my life not doing this? Uh, and then, and then there's a little film of it. And then I look at the little film and I think, that's why I haven't done it. <laughs> but it was great. I loved it. Okay. Uh, so I now just like to thank David. I think he's, He's given us lots of messages to think about, but I think I can think of two in particular. Uh, one, that it's a big mistake to starve the performing arts of funding. Uh, it diminishes our society. It's a sign of a civilized society that we have such things, and it's important 
that the performing arts are permitted to challenge us and to shake us out of our complacency. So I think that's one big message uh, for me. And, and the second one that I thought of is the importance of the live performance, uh, whether it's live music as opposed to putting on a record, whether it's going to see a play as instead of watching something on television or coming to a live lecture. Uh, so thank you for coming and continuing to come. And thank you, David, for being willing to do it. And here is our society. Paperweight. <laughs>